EQ Platoon. For, for two months, I sit at home waiting for orders. I try calling, but when I'm told I'm calling too much, I stop calling. I'm given orders, but I'm not notified, and when I'm reported AWOL for not following them, it's all about bureaucracy. I call the UA in West Virginia, and finally everything gets sorted out. My unit in Kingston promotes me from private to specialty before I leave to join my new unit at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where they have started mobilization training. Saying goodbye for basic training at Fort Leonard Wood was nerve-wracking. Good luck, Ryan, and do your best, pal, relative smiling like I was about to be in a performance. Think of Jingle Bells at a fifth-grade concert. Saying goodbye for mobilization training at Fort Bragg is sickening. I love you so much, Ryan, and I'm so proud of you, pal. Relatives crying like I'm about to be in a war, thinking of watching your own funeral. My mom, dad, Reagan, and Heather all cry like it's the last time they'll see me. We'll see you when you get home, they say. The win for hope. No one says if, but we're all thinking it. I give Heather a final kiss and turn toward the gate. The tunnel is a throat and it's swallowing me. I wave once more to my family. They hold each other and I feel detached. They say they're proud, but I feel like I'm abandoning them. I walk down the tunnel, not looking back, and wipe my tears on my sleeve. We land in Raleigh, North Carolina. I hate it already. My commander and his command sergeant, Major, pick me up. The commander plans everything, and the sergeant major carries the plans out. They make conversation with me in the car, answer their questions, but try to ignore them. The commander asks me if I'm hungry. No, sir, I lie. Once we get to Fort Bragg, the sergeant major drives us to Old Division area. Hundreds of identical two-story buildings, dressed right dressed, like soldiers standing in formation. These buildings were built during World War II for the soldiers being deployed then. I'm lonely, but I feel a sense of loyalty to them, those old soldiers who'd gone through what I am going through now. You'll be part of equipment platoon, says the commander. I get out of the back seat, grab my green duffel bag out of the trunk, and start towards the brown metal door. Nobody's around. The rest of the equipment platoon is out on FTX, field training exercise. A field training exercise is a war game. A unit stays intense, observes noise and light discipline, and pulls security shifts all night long. I jump off my stuff on an open bunk and take a self-guided tour. This barracks is two open bays stacked on top of each other. Each bay holds about two dozen metal bunk beds with a standing wall locker for each mattress. Everything's lined up, dress right, dress, next to one another down either wall. As I walk around, I think of the thousands of soldiers who have stayed here, average GIs just like me, just waiting to go to war. None of them knew at the time whether or not their war meant anything. Vietnam, Korea, World War II. I wonder how many felt detached, scared. I haven't even been away from home for a whole day, and I already feel like the end of the combat tour will never come. I wonder about the soldiers who came before me, young soldiers like me, boys getting yelled at for stubble on their chins, for not tucking in the laces of their boots. They smoke cigarettes the same way, for the same reason. They talk about back home the same way, spit the same way when they recall a fist fight in high school. They puff their chest the same way when they talk about ex-girlfriends, laugh the same way when they brag about taking advantage of them. And I feel connected with these anonymous soldiers. And I feel connected with these anonymous soldiers, people I may have passed on the street a hundred times back home. All men with scruffy beards who may have once slept in old division area. People who may have felt the very same uneasiness <clears throat> as they dumped their belongings on an empty mattress. I enter the bathroom and lean over the sink. In the mirror, my eyes are desperate. There's a longing to be understood and accepted, to be strong and brave like I should be. Soldiers seem so durable, so resilient, so heroic in war novels. On the television screen, they're afraid of nothing. I wonder if I have the same courage. Basic training is supposed to teach us bravery and fortitude. It's why I suppose I was able to maintain my composure while boarding the plane for Bragg. But courage also means being afraid, accepting a fear of the unknown. Anyone who claims to be unafraid as they sit in a barracks in processing for war is either lying or crazy. And being crazy is not the same thing as br being brave. Bravery is being afraid of something but facing it anyway. 
Life as I know it is over. For the next year or longer, my orders say 18 months, but this is an intentional overestimate. My life is on hold. It's time to do my duty, to live up to my promise of service. It's time to abandon my family in the name of my country, because that's what young men and women do when their country is attacked. Suck it up, I tell my mere self like a drill sergeant. I'm not doing this for you. At dinner, I have fried chicken and corn. I have powdered mashed potatoes and a hard roll. Then I walk home. The barracks, I'm already calling it home. The platoon is back for the night, out of the field and eager for hot showers. 50 kids from all over the U.S. Not all of them are kids, but most are under 25. None of them have been to Iraq. They wash up, joke with one another, and introduce themselves to me. The platoon sergeant, a short, stocky guy with a good sense of humor, finds me and shakes my hand. I'm Sergeant Munoz, he says. Actually, he's Sergeant First Class. In the Army, we pretty much call everyone NCO, non-commissional officer. Sergeant, sergeant, to distinguish a newer NCO from an inexperienced one, we might say he's a buck sergeant. This means he has three chevrons, pointy spikes on the top of one another, and no rockers, the curve lines underneath. A sergeant first class like Neil Minos has three chevrons and two rockers. Minos recognizes the unit patch on my left shoulder. Turns out Minos and Stuber, my squad leader back in Kingston, went through the ranks together. In Army lingo, that means they were privates together, privates first class specialists, and eventually sergeants. They grew up together. A tall, clean-shaven man walks by. He looks young, maybe 25, and seems to be in a hurry. I can see by the golden bar on his collar that he's an officer. This butter bar, as the slang goes, means that he's a second lieutenant, the lowest rank of commissional officers. I'm Lieutenant Zettelwacker, your platoon leader, he says, pronouncing the name written over his right breast pocket like Zet Wong Er. Feel free to call me LT or LTZ. And of course, there's always the default. Yes, sir, I say. He had a hearty laugh. This lieutenant, EQ Platoon, is a tight group. We take care of each other even when this command doesn't. He looks to the platoon sergeant who's still standing next to me and who smiles and nods. All right, sir, I say, thank you. The lieutenant continues on. The command set EQ Platoon for our for an FTX with no tents or supplies. They promised to send out supplies, but after the platoon sat for hours in a rainstorm with nothing more than sleeping bags, the FTX was canceled. I get down to brag, and the first thing my platoon leader tells me is that this command doesn't take care of us. This is only mobilization training. How will our unit get in and out of Iraq safely? Already, though, I'm thankful to a part of the EQ platoon. Already, I'm thanking God for Andy Zeltweger and Neil Minos. There are four squads in the platoon. First and second are equipment operators. Third is the concrete squad, and fourth is the truck drivers. I'm one of the operators, and Sergeant First Class Reniger is my squad leader. Manus directs me out the side door of the barracks where Reniger's standing. At night, any army post looks like this. Identical buildings, each with one orange light in the exact same spot. Old pine trees and about a million boot prints. <clears throat> When I meet him, Reniger is standing outside the side door, taking in the scenery, smoking a marble red. For the next year, when I need to find Reniger, he'll be standing outside a side door, taking in the scenery, smoking a marble red. Picture the rough guy in an old western movie, only wearing desert camouflage and rubbing the stubble on his chin. I gotta shave, he says. You meet the lieutenant yet, kid? Yes, sergeant, I say. Great guy. Welcome to the family, kid. And don't you worry, he says, taking a final drag. We'll take care of you. He excuses himself and steps inside. For the next couple weeks, I end process for Iraq. Paperwork, anxiety. It reminds me of enlisting. Fill out this form. Initial here. Cover your right eye and read line three. Sign here. Dot this I. Cross this T. Next. The unit gives me an option of either rushing through in processing or taking my time in meeting up with the unit overseas. Without question, I tell them to rush me through. I already feel a connection with the platoon and I don't need any more uncertainty. After only a few weeks, I see the EQ platoon and something you'll find only in the Army during wartime. With the exception of the four squad leaders, platoon sergeant and lieutenant were 50 kids. We're sitting in this barracks swapping stories and getting to know one another. We're ignoring the fact that any one of us might not return home with the rest. We're acting as though nothing serious is on our minds, as if fear doesn't grip us every time the barracks lights go out, as if we're not terrified every time we're left alone with our thoughts.